Okay. I'm ready. Hey guys, oh, take two. <laughs> Went through puberty though. you welcome to a brand fresh spanking new episode of soul journey as you can see we are clearly not in a studio today we are in the jungles of bali and i'm so excited to introduce you to a man who very unexpectedly shifted onto the spiritual path after a freak sporting accident after that he traveled the world and learned with one of the most world-renowned spiritual teachers maharishi for over 20 years and he is founder and owner of this incredible location. So please say hello to Steve Griffith. Jay Gurudev. Jay Gurudev, <laughs> Steve. I mean, this for me is such a moment because I have done a lot of interviews in my career, but none needing a sweat rag and sweating it up in the jungles of Bali with these birds flying around. I mean, thank you first and foremost for providing this opportunity for me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Alison. It's a uh... A beautiful place to bring you, so thank you for coming. Yeah, and so I'm just going to give you guys a heads up. I will be using this a lot because while I am a jungle creature, we're going to be sweating a lot today. So if you see this, it's just going to be part of the whole ambiance today. So I have been trying, as you know, to hold off on asking you a lot of the questions because <laughs> I wanted to save them for this moment. Um, firstly, I know that our, our stories are a little bit similar because we both come from strong athletic backgrounds. We're both very hardcore athletes for many, many years. And then we also both unexpectedly got thrust onto the spiritual path. So that's where I want to begin. What was that moment for you? When did your divine intervention come in? Well, I was uh, really involved in professional skiing and uh, in my youth had been really a skier, like that was my thing, sport. And, and giant slalom, right? Right, giant slalom, and then I transferred over to freestyle ski. Okay. So moguls. Wow. Um, and spent a lot. How are the knees? The knees are great, the back's not so okay. great, okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I skied in Europe and America, did a lot of skiing across America. But I had a very bad accident in aerials. Ooh, and that'll happen. That'll happen. And um, really was, you know, in traction, had nearly broken my back uh, and was really in hospital for a long while. Mm. When I got out of hospital, I was looking for things that would help improve my own physical well-being. Oh. So I looked at yoga and then really learned to meditate. Mm. And that was the game changer. The game changer was meditation. The game so? changer was meditation. Why? Well, it was such an incredible experience of when you learn to meditate and I wasn't sure what to expect. I intuitively knew that it's something I needed. Uh, but when you meditate, of course, the mind completely settles into a state of absolute quietness and silence. Mm -hmm. And the body, of course, then goes into an incredibly deep level of sleep or rest, not sleep. You're awake. Yeah. Um, but in 20 minutes, the body gets a level of rest which is twice as deep as sleep. Okay. That's how you heal. So it's in that deep state of really restfulness, but your mind's awake that your body heals. And that really was a game changer for the healing process. And you could the feel back. that, you could sense that as you were beginning the meditation, you could feel somehow powerfully internally like this is doing something. Absolutely. Yeah. And then afterwards, you know, it wasn't just the back, it was everything else that went with it, you know, not sleeping well or, you know, subtle anxiety or just not really feeling 100% really in my own self and and so that really was the game changer mm -hmm. learning to meditate and I was excited about that so yeah it was it was great because it was speaking to your soul it was speaking to my soul and, when and I wasn't a soul person right I was a very you know outward material physical person well, I didn't think of spirituality ever right yeah you were I don't want to say like ego athlete but I like, was ego okay subtle <laughs> I wanted you I, I pretended I wasn't yeah yeah <laughs> and I hear you I mean until we know better you know when we know better we do better and then, so <laughs> then we go I love that yeah. yeah we try and do better we sure do every day um 
And so is this when you aligned with spiritual teacher Maharishi, when you were getting into meditation, or how did this happen? Well, it was, I mean, in those days, this is in 1976, Okay. right? And where when are you living? You <laughs> A little bit after that, not much. Huh? Um, so, yeah, so I was... Um, you know, just overwhelmingly, uh, just sort of in awe of, of kind of the knowledge that that brought. But initially it was just my own experience. Okay. And then I went off skiing again, mm. had another accident. Oh, see, the universe will get you. If you do not listen <laughs> once, it will come back in again. <laughs> so I was skiing and meditating. And then, um, you know, then I sort of started to spend time on my own reading and and that. But Maharishi was really a great reviver of that teaching practice of meditation. So he brought that to the West in 1959. And so there were just many teaching centers in those days of, of TM. And you're living where at this point? I was living in Australia. Okay. Yes, uh, but in the ski fields in, okay. in the mountains. All right. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, I, I then decided uh, to become a teacher of meditation. Okay, and this is before you linked up with Maharishi? No, this was after I learned. No, I hadn't met Maharishi. Okay. No, I became a teacher, uh -huh. uh, you know, of meditation, but I didn't meet Maharishi really for a number of years. Okay. You know, I was teaching. Yes. But then, uh, you know, because there were thousands of people learning to meditate and all And of is that. this a particular style of meditation at this point? That's right. It was, uh, Maharishi came out of the Vedic tradition of masters, but it, it was given the name Transcendental Meditation mm -hmm. in those days in, um, in the teaching. So that's what I learned. Okay. And that's what I became a teacher of. Got it. Um, and then that's where the journey began. So yeah, okay, so we're at that moment. We're at the moment where the journey begins. Where are you stepping forward on the path next? Where is universe pulling you? You've been teaching. Yes. Then what? Well, I remained teaching and uh, really for 30 years. And you're, this is all because you, you traveled the world. Yes. So when is all this happening? <laughs> well, it's sort of part of the whole thing. You know, it was like... Um, doing things, uh, you know, for, you know, Maharishi, you know, we built a university in Cambodia for orphans where, you know, that was a five-year project. Mm -hmm. um, there were many different projects. Uh, it was really insane. You know, we were out to change the world. We were out to create, you know, make a difference. So it was a really interesting time. His focus was predominantly on creating large groups of people meditating. Because if you've read any of these studies, it's actually scientifically proven. If you get a people, a group of people together who all meditate, it reduces crime rates. Correct. The transmissions and the vibrations go out. It's That's it. Very effective. Very effective. <laughs> and you know, here in Bali, uh, there are 10,000 students meditating. So beautiful. Um, in, I think, 60 schools. Mm -hmm. um, so that was his focus. And my focus sort of you know, went there and then went to teaching in Australia. And so it was it was all in that space. Mm -hmm. all... And I want to touch a little bit on that spiritual wave at that time. Because, in the 70s. Yeah, because yeah. I'm curious, you know, since my awakening moment and all the years I've been on the path, I have just every day seen the expansion and rise of consciousness. Yeah. More and more healers realizing they're healers, you know, the light grids pinging on inside of people. And so I'm aware of the spiritual wave that's taking place now, but I would love to hear a little bit about what it was like then and your thoughts on the similarities or differences. Like, are you are you feeling the rise in consciousness in another oh, wave right now? Yeah, very much so. I mean, the 70s were an amazing period because it came out of that really disillusioned uh, 60s, you know, from the 50s. I mean, the wars, the First and Second World War, you know, Second World War, 60 million people were killed, you know, into the Vietnam War, Korean War, and then this explosion in America of, you know, the rising economic fortunes of the middle class, mm. but the disillusionment of the youth with the traditional ways of doing things. So, 
I mean, the whole hippie movement was yeah. really fueled by a kind of a desire for freedom, uh, for peace, but it, it sort of went in different tangents. And I think Maharishi then was trying to bring it back into a spiritual kind of, rather than a drug-based freedom experience, yes. he brought that back into that you can not find that in the outer world or in something that changes your state, although that's an attempt to do that, right. to understanding how you can transform consciousness through meditation, Ayurveda, Absolutely. Vedic knowledge. And that's similar to my work, uh, you know, in all my years as a shamanic practitioner, uh, you know, medicines were not a part of my journey. And so that's part of my teachings too, is letting right. people know that shamanism is not just about plant medicines and that you can awaken in massive ways without having to go Yeah, down. the drug route. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Maharishi, I think what he, he's known, obviously he did so many incredible things. Yes, yeah. But perhaps what he's most known for, at least in the U.S., is that he created Transcendental Meditation. Yes. Right, and he appeared on the Johnny Carson show, yeah. and he was the Beatle, one of the Beatles. Merv Griffin. Oh, Merv Griffin, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then he uh, taught meditation to the Beatles. And in the early 60s, yeah. So, you know, he was like a hip spiritual teacher. Well, he wouldn't see himself that way, right. but I think he absolutely, you know, he attracted like we were all, you know, because his his state of consciousness was definitely, you know, he was an enlightened human being. And so his vision of the world was so enormous, mm. you know, it was not some small thing about you as an individual, you were part of that, but he wanted to create and change the world in creating peace, really, mm -hmm. which was sort of like, wow, you know, I wake up one day and think, well, I'm gonna create world peace. I mean, that's something you see on a beauty contest, you know, mm -hmm. but Maharishi was practically doing that every day. And the Beatles, I mean, still, you know, Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr still meditating and supporting all of those projects today. So, um, but in the 70s, it was millions of people learning to meditate. So it was a, a kind of a really interesting time. It was exciting. Would you say that one of the differences, this is kind of a silly question, but was the spiritual wave back then bigger or smaller than what you're feeling now? No, I think today it's more diverse. Yes, yes. that's it's, exactly it, what I was thinking. Yeah, it, it's, it's, there's, you know, I think there was not many teachers in those days that were really interfacing with the West in a major way. Mm -hmm. um, but his teaching and his way of interfacing sort of resonated because he was science-based. You know, he was bringing out the knowledge and showing that meditation was not meant to be a religious practice or a philosophical practice, but if you sit and meditate, you change your brain functioning, you right. know, measure EG, increase concentration, memory, learning ability. You may become a philosopher, I'm just saying. <laughs> are, the chances are pretty high that that may happen <laughs> when you meditate. And so yeah. the other interesting thing, well, before I go there, and I agree with you because that's what I was tuning into as well, is that now what I'm seeing, which is such a beautiful thing, yet, you know, I'm a modern mystic and a shaman, and there's all these other, you know, like, good witches and Reiki healers, and I'm just seeing all the threads and branches in which consciousness and spirituality are birthing and emitting. It seems to be um, a wide array of options, and I feel like that's what I'm seeing a bit more now, at least in terms of like public presentation. There's a lot more public uh, figures and people that are doing this work outwardly, and there's just like a whole array of how it happens. Definitely, and I think that, you know, is sort of part of the consciousness shift, and, yes. you know, everyone is finding different pathways, you know, into that, and um, that, I suppose, is where this incredible wave of diversity is, and, um, you know, I come from a very sort of traditional practice, you know, out of the Vedic knowledge, mm -hmm. where you know, the systems of yoga, of Patanjali, of meditation, asana and pranayama, 
you know, were more an individual self-development, but the, the but the range of knowledge within that whole field, mm -hmm. like, is so incredible that the vibrational healing, you know, there's just so many diverse areas of knowledge within that, and I think that with all cultures that was there yes you know so it's like and so people from america are probably sourcing a lot of that out of the you know south american cultures and native american native american cultures and things like that so um you know it, it's all part of this transformational journey which is you know why you're here and why we love having diversity and all of that i mean what a beautiful time that we live in we're, l we're literally humanoids on gaia <laughs> during the time of the birthing of the new paradigm in this massive rise in consciousness which is you know really interesting because we're in a period called kali yuga Yes, let's talk about that. Okay, so, you know, the, the different yugas uh, have different levels of vibrational consciousness. And so we're in the end of what was the highest level, which was Sat Yuga, you know, but uh, the, the, this sort of pendulum of time, you know, people used to always ask Marashi, you know, why is it that the knowledge all gets lost? Mm. You know, and he said, that's just the nature of time that, you know, it moves through that. So the beginning of that took place 5,000 years ago, the beginning of Kali Yuga. And we were sort of meant to be in the depths now of Kali Yuga. But the work that's been done by many teachers, and Maharishi included, was to, do, to really change Kali Yuga, which is practically impossible, but through the rising of consciousness, um, you begin to change it. Now you see all these spot fires in the world, but you don't see, you know, there's not 60 million people being killed like in the Second World War. Right. You know, there's not mass, you know, it, it's still a difficult time, but it's not global. It's not, it's isolated to different regions and countries and still, there's a massive shift to take place because of poverty and, yes. you know, the economic divide, which is just really problematic. Um, but you can only, Marsh's whole thing was, you can only raise that if you somehow create the ability for people to raise their own awareness. Mm. You can't just give them money or provide a house. Yes. That was an interesting one. Like in Cambodia, when we went there, uh, at the end of, of the 80s and it was you know trying to transform you know what a country had been like mm -hmm. which is after Pol Pot and you know he, he just said you know you can provide all the money for roads and buildings and that but you've got to reinstate the confidence and self-esteem and consciousness and yeah like cellular DNA like I well mean, it's... correct yeah, remove the trauma. That's what meditation does, removes the trauma mm -hmm. and then really evolves the human being to be able to go back into society and function, mm -hmm. you know, after a whole lot of difficult life experiences, yeah. losing your parents. Yeah, so it's consciousness shift, but it's physiological. Yeah. That's the thing we've talked about yeah. just briefly. Yeah. Rub your nose. <laughs> okay, you got it. <laughs> got it? Okay. We'll cut. Question though, just answer it like it's short. J the next one I'm going to ask. Okay, ready? Camera rolling and action. Action. Okay, so where do you see this all going? Tuning the into your personal wisdom, just this rise in consciousness. Where yep. are you heading with it? Well, I think that we're heading for really changing the direction of time, you know, where uh, we, if there is more people really out there doing spiritual work, you know, teaching people how to raise their awareness and consciousness and change their physiology to operate in a coherent, peaceful, contented way, then we have to change the direction of how organizations operate in the world, mm -hmm. you know, that they're moving towards understanding how the environment is affected by different aspects of what everyone does. Do you envision great planetary change? 
Well, there must be a shift at some point. Mm -hmm. You know, there must be. Um, but, uh, you know, if we mean planetary shift in a positive direction, yes. yeah, definitely, absolutely, yeah. Great. Whether it's in my lifetime, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but I'd like to think that that could happen. Yes, that you'll be able to be with that. <laughs> okay, amazing. But the shift, you know, the main thing is the world is as we are. Yeah. You know, so the main thing is that it's really developing that within you and me mm -hmm. yes. first. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, like, I, this is incredibly beautiful, but if I'm suicidal, this is not beautiful. Absolutely. That's what I teach every one of people that ask me or students or clients or whatever. I'm like, if you want to change the world and, like, help, you know, heal the shadow of Gaia, you have to know your own shadow and do your own work first. That's right. If you want to change the world, go within. That's right. Well, that's beautiful because really for, you know, a whole forest to be green, you have to have every individual tree green. If you want world peace, you have to have individuals at peace with themselves. Amen. So. Got it. And so during this time when you were traveling the world and with Maharishi and, and really walking on your path, you were sharing space with some other great spiritual teachers that a lot of my audience is familiar with. Um, there's Guru Dev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar and Deepak Chopra, and you were right in the mix with all of those guys. And yet you all went on to obviously walk your own paths and create your own forms of consciousness and spirituality and how's it, how it goes out into the world. So I was curious to ask you, what is your calling? Like when you really land to like what Steve Griffith's earth mission is, what your calling is, what is it? I think now it's, uh, it has two really distinct parts. One is going within and spending more time on my own personal development. Mm -hmm. So it's really finding that balance between being a teacher in the world and teaching meditation and really inspiring and developing that within others, which mm -hmm. is every day of my life. Yeah. But more, it's also going within so that I can really evolve and ensure that my own personal journey, which is ultimately to develop the higher states of consciousness of my own self, are not compromised by the level of activity. So there's a balance. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be living that both in and out. So I call it 200% of life. So that's part of it. The other part is creating uh, opportunities for groups of people to live together. Um, so here in Bali, we're developing a, a spiritual home, a community of... Which I'm so excited about. Um, you know, of of people that can meditate together, that can... And Bali is... Can we chant together and dance together? <laughs> you can do that, absolutely. That We couldn't leave that out. <laughs> In Rig Vader, it says, go forth and dance together and laugh together and yes. be joyful together. Yes. So, yeah, so Bali is a, a Vedic country. Not a country, but a, an island. I mean, it's part of a bigger country. But, uh, you know, it's, you know, 10,000 meditators, um, you know, thousands of temples, you know. 24-7 ceremony. 24-7 ceremony. This is a, a blessed country. Very much. So... You know, but look at it. Like, and wouldn't you like to live here? Yes. <laughs> you know, you could spend three or four months of the year. So we're building a, a Vedic, you know, heaven on earth, uh, really community of villas that people can come and and purchase and live and spend three months, four months. And so it's an extension of these grounds that we're currently. It's an extension. On. Yeah. So we are immersed in Sukhavati and it's an Ayurvedic spa and resort. And I have been blessed to be immersing in uh, an Ayurvedic cleanse system known as Panchakarma. Very good. And it is very powerful. Uh, this is my second time doing it. And it is like, it's, it's legit. <laughs> it it's does not legit. play around. And so before we get into Panchakarma a little bit, I just would love for you to touch on um, I, I can feel and I know how special this place is, but there's so many kind of like secret things about it, like how you were saying that all the villas face towards the sun. And I just want people to understand um, some of the special magic that this place is. 
Well, it's called Vastu or Stapacha Ved. So in uh, traditional, uh, in the entire Vedic knowledge, you have Ayurveda, which is to do with transformation of the body. And then Stapacha Ved is a whole knowledge, which is uh, about how you position a house and what you do inside and all of that. So yes, yeah, so uh, all the spa rooms and, you know, your entrance and, and your, your, your your Ayurved pharmacy is all facing east, mm. which is the morning sun. And so that enlivens the quality of consciousness within uh, the place of, of where you walk into. Mm. And so, you know, the vibrational energy of that is transferring through you and with you as part of consciousness. So, you know, that's an essential part of healing. And so here, this place is uh, healing not just in a spa room, but, you know, oh, it's everywhere, the, everywhere. And yeah. that's what I love about it is, you know, I know from being a shamanic practitioner, how important it is to hold that safe, sacred space for people to really let go and surrender and dip fully into the processes and allow whatever needs to happen to happen. Absolutely. And that's what th this entire place is that. <laughs> It's very shamanic, mean, safe space. Yeah, you walk in here, you know, even for me, you know, every time I walk in here, it's like, wow, you know, it's, it's it, you know, after 10 years, the place just is continually magical. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Panchakarma. Yeah. And um, I know that if I ask you, like, what is it? We could talk for an hour about what it is, but let's just, you know, if someone doesn't know anything about it, it just some of the basics that it, it is about. So uh, Panchakarma comes out of Ayurveda, which is really the science of life. Uh, but Panchakarma is the most profound systematic treatment program for the purification of the nervous system, the removal of stress, the enlivenment of circulation, of really healing the body and also removing toxins mm. but improving digestion which then has just such an incredible benefit you know removal of insomnia anxiety improvement of blood circulation so it just it's incredible but it's very specific so when you arrive the doctor you've met and he mm, takes oh my your gosh, pulse. i love him right he's my new favorite doctor <laughs> he checked my pulse for like 10 minutes and he was so spot on he would tune in and feel and listen and tap around his third eye and then he would <laughs> say your knees or your lower abdomen and every time i was just blown away he's great yeah so He's very special because he comes out of the very, very, very ancient science of pulse diagnosis yeah. that can really pick up a disease potentially 10 years prior to it wow. becoming a disease. So then he prescribes a program. Yes. It's specifically for you, according and the, and to the your treatments. The treatments. Oh my uh, gosh. The treatments are other level. I mean, other, other level. And I've, I, as I told you, I've been getting treatments my entire life because of my athletic background. I was getting acupuncture and massages starting from like age six, hyp hypnotherapy, whatever. I've kind of done it all. And the treatments here, I have to say, they're just in a whole other realm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And so within the Panchakarma treatments, there's various, I mean, there's a whole range of things that you can get Yes, done. there's 20 different treatments. Yeah. 20 different, for every possible ailment you know within the human body yeah and but one of the first things is you have what's called an abhyanga oh you get oiled up to the maximus i mean you are just yes <laughs> and you have two people yes synchronized yes rubbing you it's incredible you know and then you have this shiradara which is where they third eye, third eye. i was having visions and then i get the basti oh on the knees, on knees. oh well done I, I mean, so imagine you guys, you come to Bali, you're in the middle of the jungles, you're held in this safe, high vibrational place, eating the m most powerful foods and juices, and then every single day, you're getting these cleansing spa treatments done. It's just, it's mind blowing. So, you know, it, it, it's really about removing what's called armor. And armor is undigested waste in the body that really circulates into plaque, inflammation, uh, cholesterol 
and you when you, you're here you're eliminating all of that mm -hmm. you know so naturally people lose weight but not exercising or stopping eating but by removing the waste mm -hmm. like the undigested waste so it's a profound and luxurious treatment and people leave I mean, I, I, I cannot tell you the stories yeah. of transformation. And it's, it's on every level, you know, spiritual, emotional, mental, physical. I mean, the things that come up, the first time I ever did one, my root chakra was doing this foundational clear, like my back went out, mm. you know, but, but, you know, it was all serving the highest good. Like I knew what was happening and where it was taking me, but it's, it's really incredible whatever needs to come up like it happens with panchakarma yeah. <laughs> literally yeah literally yes. and physically oh yeah I, we should tell you that on the towards the end of the panchakarma that there is a cleansing and clearing process <laughs> so yeah <laughs> but you know that's important because you've got to eliminate um, a lot of uh, retreats and health spas are really very superficial mm -hmm. you know it's like but here it, you get a prescription every day, like every night you, you get a schedule. Yeah. You know, there's yoga, there's, you know, the treatments. Uh, it's kind of like you're not waking up and thinking, oh, will I have a spa treatment today? Or, you know, will I go and do, you know, uh, horse whispering or, you know, whatever. Right, I mean, it, right. it, um, but, you know, it, it, it's systematically focused on the rejuvenation, revitalization of you mm -hmm. uh, prescribed by a doctor that's really deeply been able to understand your, you know, need physiologically and mm -hmm. diagnostically. It, it's incredible that yes. he can diagnose you just from the pulse. It's, I mean, that yeah. blows my mind still Me too. today. Yeah, yeah. And I come in, you know, and I go, look, I've got this. And he goes, well, we'll do this. And I go, really? Right. And then I'm, you know, he healed my knees. I had another problem. And it was, you know, but we've had people come here with cancer, mm -hmm. heart disease. Yeah. And, uh, you know, really over periods of time, but a complete reversal. I love it. So before we move on to the next topic and before we wrap, what is in one word, oh. maybe two, right. what is the personality of this place? Contentment. Contentment. I like that one. Mm. Because it, it well, the, the name Sukhavati means peaceful abode, right? Correct, yeah. So it does have, because to me, contentment means like, peaceful centered bliss or happiness that's right without contentment you can't be happy mm -hmm. that's the problem like we seek happiness but really what we really are seeking is contentment mm -hmm. you know and, and 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 people in the world are seeking contentment in everything but themselves yes so they think contentment lies in something falling in love you mm -hmm. know having enough money or mm -hmm. and all of those things are lovely but what you realize is without inner contentment you don't fully appreciate and embrace the things that you do have yes because you're unsettled amen you're always looking for something else yes you know and so contentment is really a, an, an incredibly understated word mm. but it is the the true thing that we're actually all seeking i love it mm. love that and so i think one of my last questions <laughs> is uh you know since so many of us are merging these worlds right like i'm here my calling is to merge the worlds of consciousness and media together and deliver medicine through the camera. Um, and there are a lot of spiritual teachers that are also entrepreneurs. So mm -hmm. we're like mixing business and consciousness. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. seem to do that pretty darn well. <laughs> so what is one of your secrets? Like, I don't know, you seem to be in such a state of what you were talking to me about needing to do more just like being rather than doing. So here you are, okay, just, just being, right? You're not doing yet. How do you have a place like this and you're rich, you know, you have other businesses too. What are some of your tips? Well, I think that, you know, the first thing is that, um, you know, one of the things is to not chase your dreams into the world. Uh, but really, if you're in a state of inner 
coherence and contentment and bliss, you attract the, your desires to you. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people in the process of chasing, there's nothing, I mean, we can manifest whatever we, we desire if we're in the right state. Mm -hmm. But if we're anxious about our manifestation of what mm -hmm. we want to create, we push it away. How do we not be anxious about it? Meditate. I meditate all the time. <laughs> I journey all the time. I sit at my altar. Like I let universe guide me. Like if I'm yep. supposed to be at my altar for three hours that morning, I'm there, you know, like I'm really in flow and in accordance with source yeah. and Gaia and my heart. And yet I still hit up against some of those great visions and dreams that I really want to manifest. I still hit up against a little bit of anxiousness around like, come on. <laughs> well, yeah, that's sort of a little bit of, you know, look, the only thing that stands between you and your dreams is what? My T own self. No, time. Oh yeah, time. All right. So what we're doing is that if we increase the vibrational state of our own self, which you're doing, then uh, as long as we're very clear, see most people are not clear. Mm -hmm. So one day they want this and the next day they want that. Okay. So they, they confuse the deeper level of consciousness. Mm. So on the surface mm. value, they think, oh, I want that. And then so one day they want a banana and the next day they want an apple. So that just confuses universal intelligence. Mm -hmm. So you do obviously have to go deeply within. Uh, because as you transcend in meditation, you increase the vibrational power of a thought. Yes. So at the surface value, a thought is not very powerful. That's why meditation is a key, because it takes you to deeper and deeper levels. Now, when you're thinking on that level, you're not just in meditation at that, but when you come out into activity, that thought is also more powerful in activity. Mm. So anxiety comes more... So anxiety is not about the lack of fulfillment of your desires. Right. It's really just a chemical imbalance. That's all it is. So anxiety is just mm. has nothing to do with what I want and I'm not having it. Mm. It's really stress internally, you know, some deeper level of imbalance in the physiology. And a couple of ways to help that physiology again meditation and well you know just really taking good care of yourself okay. you know like everyone on the spiritual path is also having to live in the world so entrepreneurship is more about how can I do this mm -hmm. and survive mm -hmm. you know or how can I do all of this but you know it, it, it's such a selfless activity uh, that one has to learn that the universe will always take care of you. Yeah. The moment you become interested in only my needs, you lose that universal support. Yes. Because you now, it becomes, moves from your initial goal of being selfless, but in that sense, but I there's, see. A, there's an element of being selfish in taking care of yourself, you know, because a lot of people in the spiritual world give so much that they don't look after themselves right. and that then becomes counterproductive to their work mm -hmm. so i think for me it's just been a journey and i've been there believe me mm -hmm. you know on many levels of uh but really gradually i think i learned that everything will come to you if you're clear in your mind if you have a deeper level of purpose and you don't allow fear and anxiety to actually manage your thought process because mm. it'll all happen yeah you know the universe will take care of us all uh, but we have to be clear about what we want and the only limiting factor to the whole thing is our own thinking okay you know and again back to meditation then right well yeah that's you know like <laughs> wow he's really boring no no. <laughs> no no but it's not about it's about connecting directly with that deeper level yes and um and so you know I, I have a very good friend who's a very very strong religious person and he meditates and he said you know i need to pray more and i said to him look you need to pray more and that's talking to god but then if you meditate you'll be with god mm -hmm. you know so it's like the deeper level of our own self connects with that intelligence amen so before we go, is there anything else you wish to share? If you tuned into your heart right now, 
What does your heart want to convey to the viewers? Well, I can only extend my own uh, good wishes to everyone that's watching this today that, you know, find routines and practices that you can do ritually every day that increase the higher version of our own self. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen you have to make that happen. Yes. So it's a, you have to create disciplines and routines before you go into the world, go into the world after practicing yoga, meditation, any of the teachings that, that allow you to operate with more joy, love and energy and intelligence that make your life deeply fulfilling. Beautiful. And so how can everyone, um, well, we've talked about you're not on social media. <laughs> but Sukhavati is, that's at Sukhavati underscore Bali. Um, but they, if they want to come here and be with all the birds that have been flying around us and doing all that we've talked about, they go to the website? Go to the website. Uh, what is the website? Uh, Sukhavati.com. Okay. Yeah. And the spelling, I'll put it in the notes Yeah, below. put it in. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. what is it? <laughs> it's S-U-K-A-V-H-A-T-I. Nearly. Yeah. Right? Yes, correct. Am I wrong? Or I, I think you are. I yeah. think Did I'm you right. say an H? Yeah, after the Sukha V-H, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. anyways, I don't know. <laughs> um, so go to the website. Um, anything else that you... No, no, look, um, it's been a, a great joy to have you here. Thank you. And um, I invite all the listeners to come to Bali mm -hmm. and experience the the wonderful country, the wonderful the island, island, of the gods. island of the gods, and spend a week with us, you know, don't come too short time. Yes, that's key. You need a week At least. here, and then a week exploring the island. Yes. So come for a cut. It's a long time, a long way from America. It's a long way. It's a full, yeah, like over 24 hours of flying. Yeah. Well, yeah, about 24 hours of flying. But it's, but worth, it's it. worth it. It's worth it. <laughs> That's why I'm here for the second time in four months and might be coming back next month. Like this space, this place speaks to me enough that I thought I might move here. So I'll just say that. It's incredible. <laughs> so Jay Gurudev. Jay Gurudev. Thank you so much, Thank Steve. you, Alison. You're wonderful. Oh my goodness. And <laughs> blessings to all of you. Just check the show, uh, show notes down below and stay tuned for the next episode. Well done. <laughs> great. That was so wonderful. Great oh, interview. Wonderful. You, you do a great interview with anyone.